Amen. Would you pray with me as we uh, seek to see God meet us this morning? It's not the morning, it's the afternoon. <laughs> Work habit. Let's pray. Uh, Father, thanks for your goodness to us. Thanks for your word to us. Would you make sense of it to us today? Would you open our eyes? Would you open our ears? Would you open our hearts to understand the truth of what you are saying here, Jesus, and what it means for us, what it actually means to follow you? I pray that you would do it. We're desperate for you to show up. We know we cannot make sense of it on our own. So we need you. We ask that you would do it. We ask it in your name. Amen. <clears throat> well, thank you again for having me. I wish my wife was here for that introduction <laughs> because I'm like, Nathan, you know, it's like, well, I'm a nice guy. I didn't know I was that sweet. She would be like, I, wow, wow, we should hang out with this guy. I mean, I did grow up on Mr. Rogers, which he's, you know, kind of leans toward that direction. Um, but I'm super thankful to be here. As you guys know, uh, as we just saw the map, we are a straight shot about 25 minutes down Thunderbird. So it's always fun to have another redemption, another church in general, kind of in this northwest kind of area. There, I don't know if you know this. I grew up here in Phoenix, got here in high school, and then I left, went to the University of Arizona and went a couple other places and then got back here in 2012, much later. And when I got back here, there was a total like east side, west side bias. Do you guys see this? Like it wasn't here when I was here in the 90s. I don't remember that happening because I said, oh yeah, I'm from the west side. Oh, the west side, oh, broken glass and dirt and kind of, you know, jokes <laughs> like that. Didn't help. I lived in Tucson for the seven years before that. So anyway, I love the west side. I'm a west side guy in Phoenix and thankful to be with you guys today. Um, Recently, I was with a buddy, and we are talking about what books we're reading currently. And this dude, he's like a real disciplined guy. Like, he runs a 5K every morning and then works out. The, you know those types of guys that, like, read men's health and those types of things? So we're talking about this book, and he's telling me he's reading this book right now called The Comfort Crisis. The Comfort Crisis. It's by an author named Michael Easter. It's not a faith-related book, but it's basically kind of an evaluation of our culture that basically says, like, Everything we've been striving for has been about comfort, and it's a problem in our culture. They do this study in the book, my friend was telling me that. They watched people in a mall from the first floor to the second floor, and in it, they're, they're, they're counting how many times, if there's an escalator or stairs, how many people take the stairs versus the escalator. What's your guess of percentage-wise, how many people took the actual stairs? What's your guess? Ten's too high. It's three. Three. 3%. Because why in the world would you take the stairs when you can just take one step and you magically get transported to the top of the second floor? Like that, that seems like it makes way more sense. But in the book, he's basically saying, listen, we haven't figured out that we have to move into hard things and it's killing us as a culture. Again, a non-Christian perspective. This is the subtitle of the book, which I find is interesting. The Comfort Crisis is the title. It says, Embracing Discomfort to Reclaim Your Wild, Happy, Healthy Self. And he's saying, because we are so allergic to discomfort, we're not happy. It reminds me of the end of the Pixar movie, WALL-E. You know this movie that's like no dialogue for two hours straight with this robot? It's actually a great movie, but at the end, they end up meeting the humans. The machines meet the humans, if you remember. And they're on this long, they've been on this long journey away from Earth. Do you remember this? And what are the humans like as they've made culture kind of the bullseye of their life? They don't even walk. They have screens in front of them. It's like they're automated eating. Like they just seem miserable and out of touch with what it means to be human. Well, anytime I find that people outside of the Christian faith like this author or Pixar is writing about stuff that is true in the Bible that Jesus said a long time ago, it's like, man, we better get this right. The outside culture gets us right. We better get it right. If, and what we're going to see tonight in the words of Jesus is that culture is, that, that comfort is not, is not the bullseye of our culture. That really what it means to press in, that we are going to get fruitfulness from not seeking comfort, from, from dying. That's what Jesus is going to tell. So if you have a Bible, flip it open to John chapter 12. It's not already open. We're going to walk through the text together, verses 20 through 26, which is what was read for us. Here's what it says, verse 20. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida 
in Galilee and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Let's just remember the context that we're jumping into. If you, if you haven't been with us for the last several weeks, we've been walking through the book of John for a long time. Again, we're going to take a break in Nehemiah, and then we'll jump back in to John starting in the fall. But what is happening is they are celebrating the Passover feast. This is a festival for the Jewish people. They're remembering the God of the Bible that has rescued them out of idolatry in the book of Exodus. You guys remember this story if you've been around for a while? We preached it a long time ago, about two years ago in Redemption. That the God saw his people suffering and he said, I am going to rescue you out of that. And he said, here's what I want you to do on this last plague. I want you to put blood over the doorpost and I will pass over you and I will rescue you. And so the Jewish people were celebrating, God's people were celebrating every year. They would come back and remember the God that rescues. So that's the context of what's happening here. And even the closer context we saw, a chapter earlier, chapter 11, Jesus is doing and saying things that are really making people feel excited or uncomfortable. Because in chapter 11, he goes to this guy that's been dead for four days. And he says, Lazarus, get up. And Lazarus comes back to life from the dead. And God's people, the Jewish people, are like, listen, we've been waiting. We've been waiting for this Messiah. Is this him? This seems like this could be him. But the Messiah they were waiting for was this Messiah to come in and overthrow the Roman government and make every problem go away. That's what they were waiting. And they were thinking this Jesus might be the one. The next scene we see in chapter 12, they're waving palm branches and yelling, Hosanna, as he comes in for the festival. So you can imagine the excitement is building in God's people. Like this might be the guy we've been waiting for. This is the context of what happens. Now, verse 20 says again, Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. Now when John uses this language, the Greeks, he's not specifically talking about only people from Greece. What he means is the outside community that are non-Jewish people. They're not Jewish by ethnicity or they're not Jewish by religion. They're Greek-speaking people, but they fear God. If you remember in the story of Exodus, when there's a mass exodus of two million people, they're not all Jewish people, if you remember that scene. Some people have seen this God, this God Yahweh, and they say, I want to know what this God is about. I want to worship this God like you do. Can I come along with you? And they said, yes, come along with us. And so what's happening is as this buzz is beginning to be created around this person of Jesus, and as it's the Passover in Jerusalem, the city doubles in size when people come for Passover. And so the Greek people are going, listen, we don't, we don't want to be left out. We are waiting for a Messiah too. We're trying to follow this God, Yahweh too. We want to know who Jesus is. We want to see Jesus. And a lot of times we don't quite understand the implications culturally of this text because there was a massive, a massive tension between the Jewish people because they thought they were God's chosen people and everyone else. Paul writes about them, calls them the Gentiles. John is using the word Greeks here. So much so that one commentator said this about this tension and about the, the area around the, the different Passover worship experience. He says this, the land surrounding Israel were filled with Greek-speaking peoples. The capital of Galilee, for instance, had a population of about 20,000 who knew and admired these grand festivals. Such Gentiles were invited to the feast but were permitted to go no further than the court of Gentiles. The largest forecourt surrounding the temple sanctuary. A short wall stood between them and the inner courts. Warning, it was a warning for that if a Gentile was to pass beyond that wall, it was viewed as capital punishment, okay? Because the Jewish people thought, listen, we're God's chosen people. We're clean. We're holy. We have rituals. You non-Jewish people, I mean, you're kind of welcomed in, but only so far. So they physically had a wall built up around the temple. The temple was the place where God's spirit was supposed to dwell on earth. It was where you would worship God and where you would make sacrifices of God, where you would connect with God. And the Jewish people had it wrong when they built that wall. It's kind of like early on in America, in our culture. You remember when racism was just totally fine with everyone? And the white church would say, okay, we're going to worship together. And people of color, you're welcome in, you're welcome in. You just, you need to sit in the balcony. 
The same type of tension is happening here with these people. They're saying, can we be included too? And the beauty of the gospel in Ephesians 2, specifically verse 14, when Jesus says what his life, death, and resurrection has done is it has crushed the dividing wall of hostility. This wall is no longer here. Everybody gets to come to Jesus. This is the context and the tension that they're finding themselves in. Verse 21, so these people, these Greek non-Jewish people, they come to Philip. Why do they come to Philip? Philip doesn't show up in the story of John except for the first chapter until we find him here at the end of chapter 12, which is the end of the first half of the Gospel of John. They come to Philip because Philip's name is Hellenistic. It's of Greek origin. Right? So they're going, okay, we want to see Jesus, but we don't really feel like we fit in, but we know this guy's name is of our origin. Let's go talk to him. Let's see if we can get in through him. My wife played softball at the University of Arizona back in the late 90s, and God was doing stuff in her life before she showed up in Tucson. Does that ever happen to you? Like God is just doing something behind the scenes in your life? And right before she goes down, her, the, the summer before her freshman year down there, her grandfather passes away. He was in Tucson. It's the first person she's really loved that has died. So got her to start questioning, like, what actually does happen when you die? Like, I've never really thought about that before. But then she's like, you know what, but like, my grandpa was old, he lived a full life, I'm sure he's great. I want to live the college experience, right? So she goes down there the first weekend, she's at the athlete party, she's drinking, she's doing all the things. And then she realizes, like a week later, somebody who would have been a senior on her softball team had complications with diabetes, she went to sleep, I never woke up. And so my now, now my wife's like, that could be me. Like, I, I don't have the luxury of waiting until I'm old to know where do you go when you die. It started doing things inside of her. God's spirit was moving, drawing her to himself. She gets invited to this group called Athletes in Action on campus from a fifth-year senior that says, hey, you should come check out this group. My wife's trying everything. She's going, okay, I'll go, because it was in proximity. She knew this gal. She goes, it's so crazy. That was 24 years ago, and Dave Floyd was in that room. Some of you guys didn't know Dave Floyd. He played football there. We sat in that room, and this man stood up, and he explained clearly what the gospel was, that you could know Jesus, you could be sure of your salvation, and she was like, I've never heard this before at all. What is that? She made a beeline for him. She sat down and talked to him. And within a month, she had given her life to Jesus. So the reason I tell that story is because my wife was one of eight players that came in her freshman year at the University of Arizona, which is large for a softball team to have eight freshmen in one class. And when her life changed, between the four years from that moment until she graduated, every single one of those seven other gals came to her at one point and said, what is it? Like, what, what, do you, what do you have? Like, I know you say you love Jesus now and that's all that, but like, really, you have this joy and you have this peace and you, you're different. Like, we knew you on your recruiting trip. You are different. Like, you're different. <laughs> what is it? Do the people that have proximity to you, your neighbors, your family members, your coworkers, do those people know that you have access to Jesus? They need to, right? They need to know that you have the actual antidote for the problem of the world, and it's found in Jesus. Now, they might not say what, what we see these people here saying. It's like, we want to see Jesus. But every single one of those gals that questioned my wife, that's really what they were saying. They wanted to see where this life was found. And for us as Christians, if you follow Jesus, this is part of our calling, even if it's uncomfortable. And if you're like me, you've got family members, and you're like, listen, I've had that conversation. Like, they don't, they don't want to talk about Jesus. And maybe they don't. But you, can you still show them who Jesus is? Can you still sacrifice your time for them? Can you still love them unconditionally, just like Jesus loves you unconditionally? Because they really do need to see Jesus. They're empty at the end of the day. 
If you've been chasing after things and you haven't found Jesus yet, ultimately you're empty at the end of the day. You are and you know it in your own soul. So we're called to point people to Jesus just like we see Philip and Andrew do here. So again, that's the context that we're walking into. How does Jesus respond to this request to see him? Verse 23. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Now, verse 23, you have to understand, again, if you've been walking with us through the book of John, this phrase, the hour has come, should make us stop dead in our tracks. Because what's been happening is Jesus has been doing things and he's been saying things that are crazy. And his disciples are all jacked up. They're like, you are the Messiah. Let's go. Let's do this. Let's do this. Let's do this. And what does Jesus keep saying? Not yet. My hour is not here. It's not time. I mean, can you imagine? Your, oh, Jesus. Come on, man. Let's go. Let's do it. D.A. Carson puts it this way when he's talking about this phrase, the hour has come. He says, up to this point, the hour has always been in the future. John chapter 2, John chapter 4, John chapter 7, John chapter 8. The hour is nothing less than the appointed time of Jesus' death, resurrection, and exaltation. In short, his glorification. I mean, I can just imagine the disciples. All the energy has been building, right? Right? All the things that we just talked about in a couple previous chapters, they must just be like in the tunnel. Just like, okay, okay, let's go. It's almost game time. And Jesus blows, it's time. What do you think they want to hear next? They're thinking, okay, Jesus, what's the plan? What's the game plan? Peter, you flank here. I want you to go here. Simon, you go over here. Okay, like they're thinking, okay, it's time to roll. We're going to do this. Remember when Peter's in the garden and dude draws his sword and he just lops his ear off? That's what they were thinking. They were ready to go. And then Jesus says this. I was talking to a friend. We were in preaching collective, Josh and others, a couple weeks ago. We're talking about this scene and just this idea that what Jesus says next is probably like, wah, wah, wah. Because you can see them all jacked up. They're ready to go. And then Jesus goes, actually, truly, truly, which is emphasis. He's saying, listen, listen to this. Calm down and listen. And he says, unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. they got to be like, what? What? Jesus, what are you talking about? You just said it's time. Let's do this. Why does Jesus use this example of wheat? I don't know anything about wheat until last week reading about wheat. I don't know about you. I'm not a farmer of wheat. I, don't, I mean, it makes beer and it makes bread, good things. But I don't know about wheat. And then I started studying about wheat. Wheat is crazy, y'all. Do you know how much stuff we make with wheat? It's bananas. It's in almost everything. And I think the reason that Jesus uses this example, which is crazy because the guy that made wheat is using the example of wheat. <laughs> I can just imagine him in creation with the Father and the Spirit going like, oh, I'm going to create this crop. Oh, no, yeah, I'm going to use it as an illustration about my death. <laughs> like, I think it's going to be really good. Wait for that moment, right? So, so this is the moment. Because what wheat does is you take one grain of wheat out of the stock and you plant it in the ground and you bury it for what it's meant to do. It produces another eight stocks. And in those eight stocks, there's 40 more seeds. So the multiplication on that is from one seed, you get 320. That's crazy. The grains harvested in one acre, which is an acre, which is about the size of a football field. Listen to this. It can provide a family of four with flour to make bread for 10 years from that one little grain of wheat. And Jesus is saying, listen, if my life does what it's supposed to do, it is going to have massive ripple effects. We're all sitting in this room right now at four something in the afternoon. Why? Because Jesus did what he said he was going to do and there were ripple effects. There was fruit, massive fruit because of death. And this is how Jesus uses this illustration. And if you take a grain of wheat and you, you pluck it off the head and you put it in a glass jar and you just examine it, you're like, wow, that, that looks really great. You put it on your shelf. The grain doesn't really do what it's supposed to do, does it? 
And so anytime you look at Jesus and you go, well, Jesus was a good teacher. It's a moral teacher. You've had these conversations with people, right? Like, I, I, I like Jesus, but like him having to die for all that, like that just seems extreme. It's like that would be like that grain of wheat never getting planted into the ground and not fulfilling its purpose. But Jesus empties himself. He breaks his own body to go into the ground so that fruit can come with abundance. And this idea of fruit at the end of verse 24, it bears much fruit. When you're honest with yourself, just you and yourself, and I ask you the question, how is your fruit in your life right now? And I don't mean like how much money you make or what kind of car you drive or the uploading mobile idea of success in our culture. I'm talking about Galatians 5 when Paul talks about the fruit of the Spirit. When you bend your knee to Jesus and the Spirit comes inside of you and you just start bearing fruit that you don't even know where it came from. You bear fruit like love and joy and peace and patience and goodness and self-control. How is that fruit working out for you right now? probably turn to your spouse and go, oh, you could probably use some more of it, you know what I mean? If you're having a a tough time producing that type of fruit, maybe you feel like maybe you've leveled off to some degree, I would suggest you need to learn what it means to die more because that's the prescription for good fruit is death. Let's see how Jesus continues on in verse 25. He says, whoever loves his life loses it and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life verse 26 if anyone serves me he must follow me where i am there my servant will be also if anyone serves me the father will honor him so jesus says whoever loves his life will lose it now i don't think jesus is talking about having a zest for life in general i think that's a good thing i don't think jesus is suggesting like even when he says you should hate this world you're not supposed to dress in all black and walk around and just like emo, mope, and things like that. I don't think that's what Jesus is saying. I think what Jesus is saying, like, listen, if you love the life that's offered in the world, success, security, comfort, all the things that we would say give us fruit or give us life, if you love those types of things, you know what? You're going to lose the life that you were created for, the purpose that you were created for. But if you hate those things in the context of loving what is true in the kingdom, then you will have life. And you'll have eternal life. Eternity is a long time. I don't know if you know that. It's like forever. So that's a good thing to have that. Verse 26, if anyone serves me, he must also follow me. I realized when I was preaching this at Peoria this morning, like I... I'm really outdated, right? Because when I was a kid, right, when I was a kid, we used to play follow the leader. And then all the kids were like, th- there were a couple of older kids in the, in the sanctuary or whatever. And they were like, eh, we don't play that. I don't know what that is, you know? I was like, well, Simon says. You know what Simon says is, right? Like, oh, yeah, yeah, we know what Simon says. Is. Follow the leader is basically like you pick the leader and then you do everything the leader does. You follow them up over the jungle gym, up over the jungle gym. Simon says, raise your right hand. Everybody raise their right hand. How do you lose in Simon says, by the way? All you got to do is listen and copy. It's not that difficult. It's not that difficult. Sorry, that's, that, that doesn't have anything to do with this. However, when you are playing follow the leader, when you're playing Simon says, you do whatever the leader does. Why don't we do that with Jesus, Christians? Why don't we do that? Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, follow me. You need to do what I do. What does Jesus do? He lays down his life for others. But we don't want to do that. We want to follow Jesus for a little bit. As good as it is good for us. right? I don't know how Jesus was presented to you. When you heard the gospel for the first time, whether you're young or little or whatever, like, was it something like this? Was it something like, listen, you get to follow this person. Here's where we're going. You get to be poor. You get to be misunderstood. You get to be accused. You get to be betrayed by your best friend. One of your best friends betrays you. You get to get spit on. You get to get mocked. You get to get beaten. You get to be abandoned by everybody that loves you. Come, follow me. Yes, I see that hand in the back there. Yes, gentlemen, yes. Has that ever been a gospel presentation you've ever heard? I've never heard that gospel presentation. 
usually the way you get introduced to Jesus is something like this. God loves you. He created you. He created this world, and he loves you. But because of what happens in Genesis 3, it all goes off the track because of our own imperfection, because we don't choose God, we choose ourselves. And we all admit we're not perfect, right? And because of that, there's a gap between a holy God and us who are not holy. Do you know what? Jesus loves us so much that he wanted to fill that gap. And so he sent his son, Jesus, to live a perfect life, paying the penalty for your and my sin with his life, death, and resurrection on the cross. And he's offering a gift of salvation to you. And if you pray and you receive him and if you start to follow him, do you know what? You will be with him in heaven forever. That sounds pretty good. That's not incorrect. It's incomplete. It's not incorrect. All that stuff I just said is true. But what happens if we think that's the complete version of following Jesus? What is going to happen when Jesus takes a left turn and we want to go right? We're going to go, wait a minute, Jesus. I'm in for the heaven thing, but like this other stuff you're talking about? Like I don't, mm, I'm not sure about that. And what Jesus is saying here is that fruitfulness, all that stuff, joy, peace, patience, goodness, all that stuff is found in what? In dying. But it's counterintuitive, especially in our culture because we want to be comfortable, we want to feel good, we want to feel secure, and often the way of Jesus is not those things. One image that has been helpful for me. Actually, before we go to that, I, I want to um, give a quote from a gal named Jan Johnson. This is helpful for me because if you've been around the church a while, you've heard this phrase of like, die to yourself. Like, what does that even actually mean? This is what Jan Johnson says. She says, sometimes people mistake dying to self for death of self. But self-denial is not self-rejection. God treasures your divinely created self. He doesn't want to obliterate the part of you that makes you uniquely you. God works within you and reshapes you into the person in your renewed in Christ self is meant to be. Not selfish about what you own. Not concerned about how circumstances affect only you. And not crabby when others seem to get what you want. The idea of dying to yourself, men and women, is this idea of the way of Jesus when somebody confronts you. Somebody confronts you at work about something you didn't even do. You know what you want to rise up and do in your flesh? <laughs> is defend yourself. Wait a minute, that's not right. You want to fight. Jesus is actually the way is down. What about when you get overlooked for a position that you should have gotten for some type of reason in your job or something like that, and you go, you know what? I don't have to position myself because my position is in Christ. This is what dying to yourself begins to look like. It's having those hard conversations. My wife and I were talking about the sermon after this, and she goes, you know what? This is really helpful for me because I have to have a really hard conversation this week, and I don't want to do it. <laughs> I want to just be comfortable I don't want to say the hard things, but the hard things are actually going to benefit the person that she's talking to. This is dying to yourself so that you have fruit. One of the images that's been helpful is by Paul Miller, who's been around redemption for a while. It's this image of the J-curve. I don't know if you've seen this yet, but it's basically the idea that the Christian life repeatedly reenacts the dying and rising of Jesus. So when you find yourself in a situation where you don't feel comfortable and you want to run to comfort, you want to run to security, and that comfort and security is not in Jesus but in other things, you find yourself in this J-curve that you move towards death, which is totally counterintuitive, so that you can have life. Paul Miller says the J-curve is the shape of the normal Christian life. This is the normal Christian life. Our lives mirror the life of Jesus. This is doing something at a cost to you with no benefit to you. Right? If you're a parent, you totally get this. Right? You got little kids. I don't know anybody that's ever gotten up at three in the morning in the middle of the rim cycle and they have to stumble on and they have to pick up their infant and they have to change their diaper and they walk back in and they're like, oh man, that was awesome. The smell of a dirty diaper, I love it. It just benefits my soul, makes me feel warm inside. No, 
But you do those things, why? Because you love your child. What does that look like for you, Christian? Day in and day out. There's things that practically that we don't really talk about that the Bible talks about all the time. What about fasting? Could you take one meal a week, maybe on Mondays, I don't eat lunch because I am going to pray for that lost community that doesn't know Jesus yet. Like, oh, fasting, no. <laughs> we don't need to do that. Like the, like, or you go, okay, I'm going to do that. Let's do that. Let's, I'm down for that. And then Monday's going to roll around tomorrow at about 11 o'clock and you go, I don't really feel like I was called to fast. I don't think I really heard that correctly. Like I'm not really sure. Because it's hard for us to die to ourselves. It's hard. We want to be comfortable. We're geared and catered to being comfortable. Theologians call this idea of giving up something for yourself, practicing cruciformity, this idea of the J-curve. This is how Jesus does it when Paul writes this in Philippians chapter 2. He says this, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you not only look to his own interests, but also the interests of others. Have this in mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. This is crazy. If you follow Jesus, this is yours in Christ Jesus because of his spirit. Verse 6, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. He didn't hang on to it and cling to it. Verse 7, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by being, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now, as we begin to land the plane here, some of you, you walk out of this room, and Redemption has a lot of former athletes in, in the room and their pastors and things like that, and so like, okay, I know what to do. I am going to fast on Monday. I am going to do this. And you start to go, okay, I'm going to pull myself up from my spiritual bootstraps and I'm going to die to myself. And that could be good. It also could be very dangerous. Because what the early church began to practice, specifically the Catholic church, is they started doing self-flagellation. Right? The word flagellation is just the Latin for whip. And so they would feel so terrible about their sin. They would get a whip and they would just start whipping themselves in repentance. But what it becomes is this twisted version of like, how badly can I beat myself up for Jesus? And then it becomes about you. <laughs> and it becomes about me. Also, the things we're asking, Jesus is asking us to die to, to die to our comfort, to die to our selfishness, to die to our idols, to die to our sin. Guess what? You can't do it. <laughs> I don't care how determined you are. I don't care how disciplined you are. You in your own power cannot do it. I've got some friends that have gone out to the Great Wolf Lodge, this new water park, right? They have littles and they say it's awesome. They say it's the best, it's expensive, but it's great. It's kind of like somebody said it was like Disneyland and Vegas, like together. I was like, I don't know what that even would be like, but that sounds amazing. It's this, this outside or this in, indoor water park. And every water park I've been to, I've enjoyed this one apparatus in the water park. Have you seen this before? If it comes up, maybe, there it is, okay. It's this massive bucket of water, right? And it pours in, pours in, pours in. What's the whole point of this? It pours in until the point where it can't hold anymore. What does it do? It dumps out and it lands on all the kids and everybody screams and they love it. And then it tilts back up, pours in, pours in, pours in, pours in until what? It dumps out. Men and women, this is the picture of dying to yourself in the Christian life. If you try to do it on your own, you are trying to tip over the bucket without anything going in it, and it will not work. You will get frustrated. You will be annoyed. <laughs> you will wonder, why isn't this Jesus thing working? It's because you have to have God's Spirit empowering you. That is the water that fills you up, fills you up, fills you up, so that you can what? Dump out to everybody else to come back up, to get filled up, filled up, filled up, to dump out and love other people. And this is what Jesus is calling us to. You have to empty yourself so that you can be filled up. A lot of the times we don't experience fruit because we don't empty ourselves. We're too full of our own flesh. We're too full 
of ourselves. And it's counterintuitive, but Jesus is saying, empty yourself. So when my wife has that conversation and she's walking with this gal that she's having this hard conversation with, she has to pray, okay, God, help me say it. I don't want to say it. Should I say it? Help me say it. That's emptying herself in prayer and asking God's spirit to move in and through her. This passage points again to fruitfulness coming through dying. I would ask as we close, how are you doing at dying? Let's take the stairs, people. Let's stop taking the escalator spiritually. Let's ask God to move in and through us to bear much fruit. Let's pray together. Father, thanks for your goodness to us. I pray as we come to the table this evening, we would remind ourselves of the truth, Jesus, of you. That you were the, like the piece of grain that was broken and shattered and buried in the ground as your body was broken and your blood shed for the good of us so that we could be reconnected, Father, with you, reconnected with each other, that we could be empowered by your spirit to love and care for others. May we be people that follow you, our leader, wherever you want to take us. We ask it only by the power, Jesus, of your sacrifice and resurrection, by the power of your spirit. Make it true of us. Amen.